everybody it's the time for Sunday studio um, welcome um, I missed you last week but we had uh, errands and and my um, photographer was at a golf charity event so we couldn't do the studio last week but we're here this week and I'm excited about what I want to share with you today um, one of the questions that I have been getting frequently is why don't I show the finishing marks on the painting? So basically what I've been doing the last few videos is doing the painting till I'm almost done and then I finish it and then post the finished painting on my blog. And the reason why I do this and don't finish it live is because that's part of my process for finishing a painting is it's important that I take time away from the painting so I can evaluate it and know exactly what to do to finish. So I haven't been able to do it. So what I thought I would do this week is take a painting, this one, that is almost done. It only needs a few finishing marks and then I'll show you what those finishing marks are and talk about what I am thinking about when I make those marks. Now, if you want to see the step-by-step -step progression of this painting, I'm going to be posting step-by-step -step photos on my blog today. And my blog is just my website, karenmargulis.com, and I'll be putting a link here in Facebook, and then when I put this video on YouTube, there'll be a link to my blog. But if you haven't had a chance to go to my blog, I invite you to go check it out because I post new paintings and tips every day. And so I'll be putting a step-by-step -step, uh, photos of this painting, but right now it's to the point where I have to make a few finishing marks, and I thought that's what I would like to show you for today's painting. Uh, um, a little bit of background about how it got to this point. This is a large painting for me, as you can, hopefully you can see by me standing in front of it that it's pretty large. It's 30 by 40 inches, and it's really funny. I was thinking about this this morning. I like to paint either tiny, which is two and a half by three and a half, so I have some papers ready for small, or 30 by 40 inches. These are my these are my two favorite sizes. It's kind of funny, but um, so I love painting large. This is um, a, a commission painting, so I'll talk a little bit more about how I came up with the idea and why I have the the colors and those kind of things. But first of all, what it is, it's on paper. Um, it's on UART paper that I get in a roll, and that way I can cut it to size. And so I've done several 30 by 40 uh, painting commissions from this same roll of paper. I don't mount it, um, it's just simply taped to a piece of gator board uh, with t hinge tapes. Um, when I was doing the commissions, they, they requested that the paintings be on paper and their framer would handle any mounting or whatever they have to do. I'm not a framer, so I know I get a lot of questions about framing pastels. and <clears throat> I don't frame very many pastels. When I do, I send them to a framer. So I don't really have the answers to that. All I know is they said you didn't have to mount it, so that would save me a lot of time and expense. So this is not mounted, so the framer will have to deal with getting it framed properly. Um, the, how, the, how this painting came about, I have a customer that worked with a collector who came to my studio and decided that she liked this. This was a demo of a southern marsh. She wanted a southern marsh. And she liked the color, the greens in it, but she wanted a little bit more detail in the grasses. So later on in the week, I happened to be painting, and I painted another marsh scene, and it was this marsh scene. And I sent this to her, asking if she liked this composition and maybe the colors. And, and what she decided was she loved the blue sky and the blue water and the composition, but she really preferred the grasses to be green. And she wanted there to be some indication of trees and buildings, a little bit more than I had. So I did a small study um, for her to approve. Now, if you notice, this is a six by eight study, which is the same proportions as this, so that way she could get a better idea of what it would look like. And she gave me the go ahead yesterday, so yesterday I went ahead and I painted the painting. Um, I began with a dry wash, um, and dry wash because I didn't want to risk the paper buckling since I wasn't using, um, since it wasn't mounted. 
Um, and I, the pastels that I use when I paint large for these very beginning layers are these Mount Vision pastels. So here's my stash of Mount Vision pastels. Then, and I, um, I have a bunch of them. I love these pastels because as you can see, they're a really good size and they're a medium hardness. So they're not too soft and not too hard, meaning they go a long way uh, on a painting. So they're really wonderful when you want to paint large. So I use the Mount Visions for that very first block in layer. And again, if you're just coming in, I have the step-by-step -step photos will be on my blog later, and you'll be able to see what the underpainting looked like. But basically they were Mount Vision pastels in violets and blues, I believe, and maybe I think I had yellow up in the sky for the underpainting. I rubbed the first layer in with a piece of pipe insulation foam that I've torn into pieces. I will not use this tool again, only in the very first layer will I blend it, uh, the first layer, and that is simply to cover the paper so that's less pastel that I have to use because I'm working large. I'll use those harder or those medium Mount Vision pastels for most of the painting, but then I will switch at the end to some of the softer ones. I've got some Terry Ludwigs in here, and I realized that I needed a whole lot of green, so I had to go into my green stash. So this was my green stash of just bits and pieces, but I used some of these towards the end um, when I needed to have a variety of greens. And I also ended up using some Rembrandt pastels for the grasses. And I had, as I, I was um, excited, I found this old box of Rembrandt pastels in my studio storage drawer. And I'm really excited because they, they had, did a wonderful job on these grasses. So um, it was just a variety of pastels that I used. When I started with the, the, the second layers, I started with the sky and I work my way down. And the reason why I wanted to do this is because I was generating some dust and I didn't want to cover up all these areas. Say if I had made the grasses first, then the sky, then maybe the dust would fall and dirty the grass. But I want you to see that I really don't generate that much dust. I know I've had a lot of questions about ventilation and what do I do about dust and you can see that I collect the dust in the tray and on this big painting that's the that's all that I all the dust that came about that's not a lot the sanded paper holds the pastel so well that you really don't have to worry about that much dust um, in the air but I didn't want it to dirty the, the bottom part of the painting so I started with the sky and I worked my way down I started with big fat areas of grass and then the last thing I did was started to develop some individual blades of grass. What happened though, and this happens a lot, is I got to where I was enjoying painting the grass so much that I was getting carried away and I started getting way too grassy and it was starting to look like a fence of grass down here so I actually had to go and brush some out um, and then put a few more in so that it would be not as overwhelming as it was. And the reason why I share this is because we all do this. We get to where we're enjoying the painting process so much that we forget about what we're doing and we start painting and not paying attention to our marks. And when we get to the end of the painting where I am at now, we really need to stop and really be deliberate with our marks and not just have fun. Start another painting if you're just having fun making marks, but you need to be thoughtful. So what do I do when I'm trying to figure out what to do um, for the finishing marks? I step away. So that's one of the reasons why I don't finish the demos live on, on uh, our Facebook videos because I need time away. So for this painting, I took a few hours, I took a break, did some other things, came back to it. And the first thing that I do when I come back to a painting is I take out my dry erase board. And I love these, you get these dry erase boards at the Dollar Tree. So for a dollar, I have a, a whole stash of these that I use. And what I do is I write down all the things that I think I want to address in the painting. And the reason why I do this is because if I don't write it down, I'm probably going to forget. So I want to make sure that it's written down along with what I think I need to do. Then when I go to paint, I actually come and I, here's my checklist, and I say, okay, address number one make that correction or do what I want to do, then move on to number two and number three and so on. 
This prevents me from fiddling because if I didn't go back to the painting with a plan for attack, I might just keep making marks, right? And then what happens? You overwork the painting, and I, I, I like to share this. My friend Jane, hi Jane if you're watching, she likes to say, don't finish it off. That's what we say in the South. So you don't want to finish, you want to finish, but you don't want to kill it. You don't want to finish it off. So if you know what you're going to do, chances are you'll be able to stop. Um, so what I thought I would do for you is make, go over these things that I decided needed addressing and make those corrections. First thing, how do you know what those final marks should be? Well, it's important for me that when I am designing my painting that I have a plan for the viewer's eye to flow through the painting. So a waterway or a road or anything like that, that's a pathway. The eye's naturally going to want to follow that pathway. So you want to make sure there's something interesting along the way and also when they get to the end of the pathway. So I have to find, make sure that the eye is going to flow along this pathway and then get to the distance and then exit the painting. I want to give them little interesting areas along the way, something for them, for the viewer to enjoy, little pieces of eye candy. And I like to call them spices. And it reminds me that I want to put something in there that makes it exciting, right? But if you put in too many spices, it's over too much so I have to be very careful with the spices so what I decided was in this painting the eye is flowing fairly well and we're jumping from area to area here but these areas seem neglected there there's not much in the way of a good transition and they're kind of boring so for a, such a big painting I wanted to make these areas a little more interesting but not so interesting that <clears throat> that's where I go first. So I said here, in the middle ground, the transition areas on the left, maybe put in a lighter uh, ridge of grasses and a few tall mid green grasses. So I wrote that down, so I'm gonna go ahead and make those corrections. Let me just grab my towel. So that means over in this area, I'm going to I'm going to just brighten up this area with this color, this ochery green color. And then I said I wanted a few more bright green grass, mid green tall grasses. I like this one little bit of grass, so I want a few more. Here's, this is a really important piece of advice. When you're making the finishing marks, what I like to do is make a few marks and step back and say, is that okay? do another one and I usually will say don't do more than three marks without stopping so if I do three marks I want to stop and make sure I didn't overdo it maybe one more I don't want them all to go the same direction see I can I'm already starting to get carried away stop so now I ask myself did those things make this area a little bit more interesting but not crazy so I'm like overwhelmed and I think maybe just a couple more and that, that's good. So that's number one. Number two, on this right side, I said I need to put more bright green to the right. So that was, I believe it was that color. And I thought that was a little bit too isolated. So I'm going to just put a couple more pieces of this, move it into this area and maybe just a little bit in this area right here. So just a couple of little bright green marks again make a couple of those marks and then evaluate it remember i wanted to make this area a little bit more interesting but not more important than anything else just a couple of blades of this brighter green grass and maybe right in here and then I'm going to stop. Then number three, a few spots of eggplant in the foreground shadows. These are things that I wrote down, so I have to remember. What did I mean by that? Oh, I don't remember. I need to make these foreground shadowed areas at the base of the grasses a little bit darker than they are. Because right now, 
the darks in this area, the darks in this area, and the darks in this area are all about the same value. And really, aerial perspective would say that they would get lighter. So I could make them lighter, but I can also make this darker, which would make those automatically seem lighter. So I'm going to take this, that might not be the right one, really darker. I said eggplant, I don't have that one handy, I don't think, but I have a nice darker color. And I don't want to go crazy with it, I just want to put a few little spots of something darker. I'd actually go a little bit darker than that. Try this dark blue. But I don't want to darken anything else up in that way. The other thing that I could do is lighten some of the areas back here. So I could come in with a, a little bit of a cooler green and knock those back slightly so they're not quite as dark. I like those that way there. So that's number three. Number four, I need a little bit more spice. And number five is I need some smaller buildings on the left. What I decided when I was looking at the painting is that I'm having dueling buildings. So it's like these guys are in a feud. Who's more important? They're both equally important. So I need, and there's too even, right? So they're too much the same. So I need to make one area more with more than, than that, than the other. I have to make them, they're too balanced. So what I decided I would do is throw in a few smaller buildings on this side back here. And really all I'm going to do is put a couple of pale blue marks. And the idea is these are supposed to be um, just little hits of life back in there. And so now this area has a little bit more going on and it's not as, not as regular. So I hopefully I've broken that up a little bit more. And then finally, my eye is moving and it's grabbing onto these nice spots and I go here, but how can I pull the eye over to look over here? Well, I have this nice bright green mark over here and it's pointing over there, but is there anything grabbing my attention over here? Mm, maybe, but I could maybe do a little bit better job. So I want to have a really interesting spice color. And when I'm not sure what I want to use for a spice color, I take out my analogous color wheel, which if you follow my blog, you know I like to use this. By the way, you can get it at, uh, through artvideo.com or Dakota has them available. And so I love this. It's based upon the Munsell color system, which I love. Um, I find very pleasing. So what, I'm, what I use it for is to help me determine what colors I want to use for spices. So what I did was I lined up the colors that are the dominant colors in the painting. So I've got yellow green to green to blue green. It tells me that the complement would be a red purple. Well, I used red purple in the underpainting. So little bits and pieces of it are peeking through the painting, which kind of unifies the whole thing. It tells me that the discords would be either a, a red orange or a blue violet. Now discords are like spices. They're like colors that you can use in smaller amounts, usually where you want the eye to look, and they're used in small amounts. You don't have to use both of them. So I'm really interested in this blue violet. I like that. So what I thought I might do is try anyways to take some blue violet and put a pop of it right over in here. And so hopefully that's just a, just a tiny touch of interesting color that I might be interested in looking at. So when I go from here to here, there's something more interesting over there. What if I threw a little dot of it right in here? That's too much, so get rid of it. You don't want to overdo it, so it's better to stop than to go crazy with it, because it's really easy to find something you like and go crazy with it. So now I'm at the point where I think I made all those corrections that I wanted to do, so I would stop at this paint with this painting and, uh, of course, make sure that the person who commissioned it is pleased with it, 
And since it's a commission, she may have me do something else to it, I don't know. But if it were my own painting, at this point I would definitely want to stop. So that's my process. Basically when I'm finishing a painting, I take time away and I write down exactly what I want to do and I only follow what I want to do. If there's something else I want to do to it, I want to make sure that I know why I'm doing it. I don't, in other words, I don't just go and fiddle around with it because to me then I will tend to overwork and lose any freshness that the painting may have had. So I'm going to um, sign off now and then I'm going to go ahead and, and take pictures and load the whole thing to my blog so you can see the progress shots and hopefully this has been helpful for you and if you have comments ask them and I'll be uh, answering them and put them in the comments and please share if you found this helpful and you want to share this video with your friends and uh, thanks and I'll see you again next time